Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So grateful, so thankful for all that You've done for us in Christ. I ask that You would take charge of this time, filter out all of the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is true. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We're still together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse, and we're at chapter 5. A delicate passage of Scripture, no doubt, uh, dealing with church discipline, but right away the tendency is to just, well, kind of toss grace out, out, of the, out the window, out of what is pictured here. And I believe that is a thought that we have to resist right from the very outset if we hope to understand the heart of the message that's in this for each one of us. I believe we would do well to understand first and foremost that this physical act of sin is really no worse in the eyes of God than any other sin that you could imagine. If all you ever did was steal a penny, Christ would have to suffer and die for that sin. I believe, as I pointed out in the last video, the spiritual aspect, which uh, Scripture calls the fornication, is something you might want to consider. I do not think that the lesson for us here is only about this one who has his father's wife, but the church at Corinth as a whole. God works in us both the will and do of His good pleasure, always in love, always in gentleness, and always by grace. I believe that the destruction that we're going to look at can mean either spiritual ruin, though in some cases it may even mean physical death. I believe that the flesh could be referring to the old man, self, not just the physical body. I do not believe for a second that God is washing His hands of, of the man or that He has the ability to resist God's chastening hand. Discipline is always and only for our good. In fact, every work of God in our lives is. I believe He is a child of God. I do not believe that a Christian can ever refuse God's correction. Hebrews tells us that He chastens every son whom He's received. And He does so for our good, as well as for the good of the body of Christ as a whole. And what affects one member affects every member in the body. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In short, I fail to see anything negative about this handing over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh at all. Now, you may not agree with me, but that's where I stand. So we're going to spend some time looking closely at the text. To begin with, I'm going to ask you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. And I want you to look at verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the Word of God. Now just turn over just a few pages to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and look seriously at verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when ye received the word of God, which ye, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So we go back now to our study in Corinthians. This is God's word. This is not Paul's word to the Corinthian believers. No doubt Paul wrote this epistle, but he's not the author. And it's so easy to lapse into these, well, are Paul's thoughts, these are Paul's reasonings, this is Paul's logic. I wonder what Paul's idea is here, and you hear it in study after study. Not the point. This is God's Word. And we should take it and look at it and study it as such. Not man's Word, not Paul's ideas, 
not some dated writing that's nearly, I guess now nearly 2,000 years old, but something that is in truth the Word of the Sovereign God. We began in our study in 1 Corinthians uh, last video. I tried to give you a little bit of an introduction. It was my hope then at least to stir up your minds to think about it for a few days. In the first chapter of this epistle, we were told that it was God's church at Corinth. It wasn't a group of people that got together and decided to start a church or a Bible study. It was God's church. And where God's Word is involved, God's presence is there. They were rich, enriched in everything. They didn't come behind in any spiritual gift or, or spiritual grace and they were going to be confirmed to the end by Jesus Christ. Marvelous, marvelous way to begin this epistle. What wonderful truth for the believers in Corinth. But there were contentions there. They had divisions. So when Paul came, he said he didn't come with excellency of speech or, or wisdom. God didn't want Paul to be the presence that dominated the teaching of the Word. His speech was contemptible. He was there in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And all he taught was Jesus Christ and Him crucified. All he taught was Jesus Christ. That's what he taught. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So we came to them pointing out that with, with all of that truth, they're carnal. Their actions as those whom God loved were carnal. And why should this be in God's church when they were not lacking in any spiritual grace? When they were so greatly enriched by Jesus Christ, yet they were acting carnal. They were acting fleshly. Not like the spiritual believers that they really were. As we begin chapter 5, it's reported commonly. There's, there's fornication among you, and I made suggestions like, why this particular sin? And I perhaps published that video with the title that I thought would have some shock value given the fact that God views fornication from both a physical as well as a spiritual standpoint. That spiritual fornication or whether physical or spiritual, is a sin against the natural, earthly family, as well as God's family, the body of Christ. And how I pointed out how that God calls fleshly, law-keeping, spiritual adultery. A sin that is no less serious than teaching false doctrine. And there's plenty of Scripture on the fact that there are false prophets among you we all understand this, that in the last days perilous times shall come and there will be those who depart from the truth and teach iniquity. And dearly beloved, it is serious. That's why Timothy is exhorted to take heed unto doctrine that he might not only save himself, but them that hear him. It's astounding today to hear the comments that are made about biblical doctrine. People don't want to hear biblical doctrine. They'll say that it causes divisions, it causes contentions. When the absence, the truth is that the absence of doctrine is what really causes divisions. If you teach serious doctrine, the membership, or in this case, video views, or the offerings drop off, churches don't grow. Seriously difficult to find a serious presentation of biblical doctrine. I mean, forget doctrine. You know, we should just love one another. I think I mentioned in one of our studies, a man I was working with said, I do not believe in the Bible. I don't believe any of that. My religion he said, was just that we love one another. And I said, well, now wait a minute. You stole that from the Bible. I mean, where did you get that idea? Buddhists don't love Buddhists. Confucians don't love Confucians. There is no religion in the world where people love their God and one another except Christianity. And 
Now, I hate to call it a religion. How do you know that without doctrine? It, because it doesn't do me any good to say, you know, well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved if I don't know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. If He's the offspring of a Roman soldier who raped a woman, and that's no good to me, I don't see how that you can tell me anything that's worth believing if I don't know biblical doctrine. Doctrine is vitally important. Timothy, take heed to doctrine. So we've, been, we've already been introduced to the fact that this is God's church. We have to deal with their carnality. And so we're looking at a carnal activity, and I, and I pointed out as we looked at this, everybody in the church knows this man's living with his father's wife. I think it was a, his stepmother. I'm not going to spend time again on the comments I made last week, whether this is his mother or another wife of his father, which is what I think. But... Paul said that he came in weakness and in fear and much trembling, in tenderness and gentleness, teaching only Jesus Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit does. And he preached doctrine. It is commonly reported. Everybody talks about it. You're puffed up. You haven't rather been in deep sorrow. You haven't mourned that the one that's done this be taken out of your midst. Why? Because that kind of moral corruption corrupts the whole lump. We'll see that in the following verses. And I pointed out how that that, that is a sin against the body. And if one sins against the body, it's a creeping corruption that leavens the whole lump. We know that the Holy Spirit is pointing out it's not Paul, it's the Holy Spirit. He sent Paul there in weakness and in fear. Probably a thousand places Paul would have rather been. But there he was in that condition. And now he writes, verse 3, For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. End of sentence. That's quite a sentence. I mean, I, I couldn't quote that sentence in one breath. Boy, that is a problem sentence, let me tell you. It is way beyond an intermediate Greek class. That's a rough sentence to translate. If you don't believe that, then just read the various translations. I have labored over translating this sentence. I don't know what translation that you're accustomed to. I'm, I typically use the King James. But they're all different because it is just that difficult. There are so many clauses there, and you just don't know where the clauses belong. Now, the general conclusion among decent theologians is that this is a, an excommunication, and it was performed by the church at Corinth. They got together, the elders, the board, uh, the congregation, whatever, and they had an official uh, legal meeting and they excommunicated this man. I don't think that's what happened. I cannot, no matter how I wrestle with this sentence, come to that conclusion. If excommunication means delivered to Satan, then this is the only case where it occurs. Unless you refer to 1 Timothy, where Hymenaeus and Alexander were delivered to Satan that they might be taught not to blaspheme. However, that apparently is a different situation. I am not the president of, of Can't Be Wrong Seminary of Southeastern Oklahoma. All I can tell you is there is nobody, in my opinion, who wants to know the truth of this book any more than I do. I do not want to teach error. 
and I have wrestled with it since you saw me last. I don't know, but I'll, I'll tell you what I don't think, and what I think doesn't really make much difference. I don't think Paul delivered this man to Satan. I think the Holy Spirit did. Paul is fulfilling the Word of God. Paul is speaking the Word of God. Not because Paul's good or smart or great or brilliant, but because God prepared him, because God called him, because God fitted him to fulfill the Word of God. So these are not Paul's words. These are the Holy Spirit's words. And I think only the Holy Spirit can deliver anyone to Satan. Excommunication, legally, strictly speaking, is a legal action. It's a legal proceeding, and there is nothing legal about this. I just can't simplify this by saying this is excommunication. If it is, it's the only case that I can find in recorded history where excommunication is called delivering someone to Satan. Now, when I say that, I want to point out to you that verse 13, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. I mean, that's, that's the verse usually used to support this action is excommunication. Literally speaking, it's an action Paul, Paul took. But dearly beloved, this is God's Word. It's an action that the Holy Spirit took, who has Paul recording it in a very labored sentence that indicates clearly that Christ and the Spirit are there. So if you want to say He's working through them, I suppose that's fine. I'm sure that Paul agreed with that because Paul is being led by the Holy Spirit to fulfill the Word of God. This is God's Word. This is what God did. The Holy Spirit delivered this man over to Satan. That's what I believe. And what I've tried to point out is that this is not a church activity. Put away from yourselves this wicked person. We could say we remove his membership but that's separate from this text. That's added after this. This text says it's already done. In verse 13, they're to do something that they haven't yet done. But where we are now in verse three, verses 3, 4, and 5, we have an activity that is done, and this man has been delivered over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. In order that, there's a purpose clause here, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does it mean when the Holy Spirit delivers someone to Satan? Well, there are those who say that when he's delivered to Satan, he's no longer being led by the Holy Spirit. That cannot be the case. If you have not the Spirit of God dwelling in you, you're none of His. So this is a... This is really a, a pretty neat verse for the Arminian and many of their commentators, commentaries say that unless this man repents, he's now going to hell. He's under Satan's dominion and he's on his way to hell unless he repents. He's not going to go to heaven. Yet the verse clearly states that he may not be saved, that is, delivered, we are looking at an activity of the Holy Spirit in order that He be delivered, maybe He will, maybe He won't, in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe He will, maybe He won't. It's in the subjunctive mood. In the day of the Lord Jesus. The subjunctive mood, the mood of uncertainty. So the verse does express uncertainty. This man's not going to hell, folks. So being delivered over to Satan doesn't mean losing one's redemption, but it may mean losing his salvation. And I think it does mean that. The problem with that, though, is that so many people have made salvation and redemption synonyms. They are not. We are redeemed in order to be saved. You know, they'll say that to be saved is exactly the same as being redeemed. And I don't believe that's true. I've done many videos on that. 
Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed? Well, our, our redemption's nearer than when we first believed. Well, I thought that Jesus Christ was my substitute, that He took my sin. He who knew no sin was made sin for me, that I might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That is a finished transaction. By one sacrifice, He has perfected forever them that He set apart. How long is forever? How long is forever? Until He's delivered over to Satan? And folks, I can't do that. If you can do that with the Word of God, I don't understand how you come to this book. This man is either perfected forever in Christ, or he never was. But he must have been because the purpose of this deliverance to Satan is salvation, rescue, deliverance from the flesh, from that carnality of the Spirit, not the redemption of this man, but the deliverance of the Spirit. Do I believe Paul was involved in this? Well, sure I do. As the one that the Holy Spirit is using to give us God's Word, Paul's involved in it. But I keep reminding you, this is the Holy Spirit writing this. It's the Holy Spirit doing it. Just as, it's, as it is the Holy Spirit that's authoring this book, Paul's writing it, but he's not the author of it. I do not think Paul has the ability in and of himself to deliver anyone to Satan. If he does, it is because he's an apostle. I don't think any church has. I don't think that you have that authority, or I have it. I don't think anybody else has. And it's only mentioned twice in the Scriptures. It's only mentioned twice. I do not believe the text is saying he is being delivered over to Satan unto physical or spiritual death. That's just my opinion. I don't see that in the text. To deliver this man unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh, the, the word destruction there does mean death. But the word is not thanatos, it's alathros. It's a, it's a word that means death, but not death like thanatos. Like the wages of sin is death, thanatos. Alathros can mean ruin, spiritual ruin. Romans 14, 15, do not destroy, that is ruin with your choice of food, that person, your brother, for whom Christ died. 1 Corinthians 8, 11, so this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed, that is ruined by your knowledge. It's not saying you're sending a brother to hell. So by your way of life, you can ruin a brother for whom Christ died. But you're not going to kill his body. And you're certainly not going to send him to hell. What is Satan supposed to do? Is he supposed to kill this man? If he did, well, he's now with the Lord and you're still here. Delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And folks, to me, that sounds like a good thing. If it's the destruction of the old man, the old nature, which we call flesh, carnality. You know, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness. You know it in Galatians 5. If that's what the destruction of the flesh here means, that's not just a good thing. That defines the very word saved, sozo, delivered, deliverance. As members of Christ's body, the church, we should want that kind of deliverance. He needs the destruction of the flesh. O wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death, Dearly beloved, show me a church that understands those words, O oh, wretched man I am. And I'll show you a church that has deep sorrow over this man's sin, which is something God says these Corinthians have not done. Think about it. Think about it. According to the truth of this book, most serious Bible students agree on the fact that there is a divinely engineered, a God-designed, God-desired end goal in mind on the part of God as it concerns our relationship, our walk with Him. And that is that we trust Him above all else, 
above all else, God desires that we trust in Him and not ourselves. It has been said that when self-dependence ends, God-dependence begins. And that can only occur when we come to the end of ourselves. And by that, I mean confidence in ourselves. Confidence in the flesh. Our own works, our own merit. But forget about all that. We're just supposed to execute, communicate to guy? I don't think so. Toss him out on his ear? I think we are looking at a situation in which God is working in the life of this man, and it can only be, only be, only be for his good. Here's Ananias and Sapphira. They come in and they lie to the Holy Spirit, and God strikes them dead. There's Nadab and, and, and Abihu. They offer strange worship and God strikes them dead. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You, you say that you can't wait to go home and be with the Lord. Those four, four people are way ahead of you. Okay? And so, so may this man be. What's so wrong with being struck dead? I don't know. You can wrestle with that if you want. I don't know that I'd want to stand in the presence of my God, of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who told me to study to show myself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, who told me to take heed unto doctrine that I might save, deliver myself, I'm already redeemed, and them that hear me, who told me to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith I am called, and I stand there, and He had to strike me dead because I lied to the Holy Spirit. However, am I to think that there are some people for whom heaven isn't good? I can't say that. What I do see in this book is an accounting before the Lord and how we build on that foundation of Jesus Christ, His person, His work. And Ananias and Sapphira didn't do a good job. Neither did Nadab and Enabiah. So maybe their works are wood, hay, stubble. I don't know. I hate hearing people say, well, I'm just happy to go to heaven, Steve. I don't care whether I have a reward or not. Man, you know, compared to hell or compared to this place, heaven's got to be good. All I want to do is get there, forget the reward. And folks, to me, that's like saying... Lord, I'm not the least interested in what you want. I'm not at all interested in your rewards. I just want me taken care of and, and I just want to go to heaven. And that's a pretty bad attitude. Yet the same people that tell me that, they want to be the best baseball player, the best football player, the best basketball player, the best golf player, you know, the the best engineer, the best scientist, the best cowboy, you name it, okay? But they don't really care about being the best when it comes to anything spiritual. They just want to get there. You know, it's up to you to decide what you believe here. Dearly beloved, the only reason you don't sin more than you do is God. You would be a mess if He did not stop the lusts of the flesh. Because the opportunities to sin are enormous. But you, because you love Him, you don't want to sin. You sin enough as it is. But given free reign, you'd be in a real mess. The church hasn't become sorrowful because of this. So God delivers him over to Satan for the destruction, the ruin of his flesh. Let's him come to the end of himself that his spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. That is what I believe. I do not think that you can sin with impunity. As far as forgiveness is concerned, He's perfected you forever by one sacrifice. But what He perfected was that new man, that sinless new man, we saw it in 1 John, that new unleavened creation born of God. All who are born of God don't sin for a seed abides them in them and they don't have the ability to sin. That's true. But the trouble is, He's put you here in a vessel of clay. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
2 Corinthians 4, 7. You cannot overcome the sin of the flesh through self-effort. You're to reckon yourself dead to, to that nature. Can't do it. Not without the Holy Spirit. And it's God Almighty who directs your steps. And only God. I don't believe for one moment the church at Corinth can do this. And I do not believe verse 13 has anything to do with our present study. Yes, Paul wrote this. I know you're getting tired of, me, of hearing me say it. But the author is the Holy Spirit. So I can say that the Holy Spirit says... I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That's what I believe he did. That's what will happen. If you are his, it will. The first two verses of Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We know that sin results in death. Romans teaches us that. It teaches us that we've died to sin that we might bear fruit unto God. Our old man, we see in Galatians, was crucified with Christ. The flesh profits nothing. We read in John 6 that it is the Spirit that quickens. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If in fact we are living like who we truly are in Christ, understanding all that God has done for us in Christ, coming behind in no spiritual grace, dearly beloved, would it not make a difference in how we then live? It's the absence of doctrinal truth that results in either one extreme or the other, either legalism or licentiousness, carelessness, apathy, indifference, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? That's what we're seeing here in Corinthians. Is the source not your pleasures that wage war in your body's parts? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder, and you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend what you request on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world, that's the religious system, is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture says to no purpose, He jealously desires the Spirit whom He's made to dwell in us. Are you getting the connection here? But He gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and He will come close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, listen, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. Satan wants you to doubt God. He doesn't want you to die. He wants you to live doubting God outside the realm of the Holy Spirit, which leads to destruction and perhaps eventually physical death. But I, folks, I don't think I can push the word that far. It will lead to destruction. Maybe the prodigal son is, is somewhat of a case like that. But I will not take the position modern theology takes that unless this man repents, he's going to hell. I do not believe Repentance is necessary for redemption. It may well be necessary for deliverance, for salvation, rescue. So maybe his condition is going to be so bad that as the prodigal son, he suddenly says, now wait a minute. It was better back there. It was better in my father's house than it is in Satan's domain. 
All I know is that whether he lives or dies, he's the Lord's. Clearly, the love of God is shown here in these verses, folks. The reason this man is delivered to the realm of Satan is because he's living in open fornication, open filthiness, and boasting about it. And the people that he fellowships with are boasting about it. So he's delivered because of that. I don't believe any one of us has truly discovered the depths of God's love for those for whom He died. Is God working in this man to will and do of His good pleasure or not? You decide. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for listening.